This video describes how to perform the ultrasound-guided femoral nerve block, which is one of the core regional anesthesia techniques for the lower limb. The femoral nerve is blocked in the inguinal region and will provide analgesia of the skin of the anterior thigh and knee via various cutaneous branches, and also the skin over the medial leg, ankle, and foot via the saphenous nerve. It innervates the bony femur and medial portion of the proximal and distal tibia. But importantly, there are also high branches that supply the anterior hip joint. Note that these are only likely to be blocked if there is proximal spread of local anesthetic. The femoral nerve also provides both sensory and motor innervation to the quadriceps and sartorius muscle, which are an important source of post-traumatic pain, either from actual muscle injury, swelling, or muscle spasm. At the same time, the accompanying motor block of the quadriceps is the major limitation, as it hinders ambulation and increases the risk of falls if appropriate precautions are not taken. However, if the patient is not expected to mobilize or wait very immediately, the greater coverage of the femoral block will provide superior analgesia compared to other motor sparing techniques, and thus may be a better choice. For calf and ankle applications, a selective saphenous block is recommended. A linear probe and a 50 mm needle is suitable in almost every adult patient. 20 milliliters is a generally sufficient volume, and I usually do not exceed 30 milliliters. For surgical anesthesia, our local practice is to use a one-to-one -one mixture of 2% lidocaine and 0.5% bupivacaine. For surgical analgesia, I favor 0.25% bupivacaine, but 0.5% ropivacaine may also be used. Intravenous or perineural adjuvants such as dexamethasone can be used to prolong the duration of single injection blocks as needed. The patient is placed in the supine position for the block. External rotation at the hip can be helpful but is not essential. Stand on the side of the patient to be blocked as reaching over the patient often involves too much bending and stretching. The ultrasound machine may be placed across from you on the other side or at the patient's head on the same side of the bed. Either way, ensure a straight line of sight between your hands and the screen that doesn't involve twisting your body. Surface anatomy is very important in the femoral nerve block, and this is actually one of the easier blocks to do using a landmark guided approach. Expose the groin from anterior superior iliac spine to the upper thigh and identify first the femoral or groin crease, but also the inguinal ligament, which lies more cranially running between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle. The correct site for probe placement is between the groin crease and inguinal ligament. The groin crease itself is too low for probe placement. At this point, the femoral nerve will have started to divide into its terminal branches and the femoral artery will also have divided into superficial and deep femoral arteries. It is a common mistake to place the probe in the groin crease, however, just because it is usually the most obvious, especially in obese patients where a panis is obscuring the inguinal ligament. If the patient is very obese, an assistant will be required to retract the panis or it can be taped in position. This example here is a gross exaggeration, but I think you get the picture. For the eagle-eyed among you, note that in this illustration of the landmark-guided approach in the upper right, the needle skin puncture appears to be at the groin crease, but because of the angle of insertion, the needle will contact the femoral nerve more proximally, close to the inguinal ligament, as described. The femoral nerve can always be visualized if a systematic sequence of scanning and landmark identification is used. This signpost approach is a cornerstone of my practice as I find visualizing nerves just as hard as anyone else. The first signpost to look for is the femoral artery. Search for it by sliding the probe in a lateral to medial direction and back again, looking for pulsatility. If multiple arteries are seen, this is not an anomaly. It just indicates 
that the probe is too caudal, probably in the groin crease. Lift it out and place it more cranially closer to the inguinal ligament. The second signpost to identify is the iliopsoas muscle, a dark hypoechoic triangle lateral to the artery. The femur may sometimes be visible deep to it. There are two fascial layers overlying the iliopsoas muscle, the fascia iliaca and fascia lata, which are the third and fourth landmarks to identify. By definition, the fascia iliaca is the layer investing the iliopsoas muscle and the most important thing to know is that it runs medially to dive under or deep to the femoral artery. The fascia lata, by contrast, runs medially over or superficial to the femoral artery. The femoral nerve always lies deep to the fascia iliaca, which splits to encase the nerve in its own fascial compartment where it rests on the iliopsoas muscle. It is critical to recognize these fascial layers so that the hyperechoic area that's immediately adjacent to the femoral artery is never mistaken for the femoral nerve. With practice, pattern recognition will become second nature. Recognizing the fascial layers is a vital step in the sequence because the femoral nerve can sometimes lie unusually close to the artery. We first reported this in 2011, but I have since observed it multiple times. It occurs most often in patients with well-developed muscles, presumably because the hypertrophied iliopsoas bulges medially to push the femoral nerve against and sometimes even under the artery. As I said earlier, the most important thing is not to mistake the hyperechoic area between fascia lata and iliaca for the femoral nerve. Here is a prime example of this phenomenon. In this individual, the femoral nerve is not immediately obvious. The femoral artery is identified as is the dark hyperechoic iliopsoas muscle, which is more of a rectangular rather than triangular shape here. The fascia lata and iliaca are also red readily identified, and knowing that the nerve lies under fascia iliaca and on top of iliopsoas, it becomes clear that the femoral nerve is the structure immediately next to the artery and even partially under it on the right leg in this individual. However, in most patients, the femoral nerve is usually located well lateral to the artery and on top of iliopsoas, under fascia iliaca, and usually has an elongated elliptical cross section. The nerve often exhibits a degree of anisotropy, so it may not always be immediately obvious, as in this example. Tilt or rock the probe back and forth while looking at the expected location on top of iliopsoas and under fascia iliaca, and the nerve should light up. Identify the borders of the femoral nerve, especially the lateral edge of it, as the objective will be to enter the fascial compartment at this location with minimal needle to nerve contact. There are a couple of vascular structures to watch out for. As mentioned, if the probe position is too caudal, the femoral artery will have branched, but you may also see the lateral circumflex femoral artery lying deep to the femoral nerve. If the probe is too cranial, on the other hand, you may see the superficial circumflex iliac artery and vein as a hypoechoic pulsatile or compressible structure lying superficial to the femoral nerve. An in-plane or out-of-plane needling approach may be used. Most of the time, I favor an out-of-plane approach, which partly reflects my training in the landmark-guided approach and experience with femoral nerve catheters. In my opinion, it is the best approach for femoral nerve catheters, as the catheter will thread along the nerve, which minimizes malposition and dislodgement. However, even with single injection blocks, there are advantages to the out-of-plane approach. The needle is not pointing towards the nerve as it is advanced, 
which reduces the risk of inadvertent trauma. The needle track is also shorter. But probably most important, there is a greater tendency for the local anesthetic to spread proximally when injected, which ensures that articular branches to the hip are reached. The idea of a two-in-one or three-in-one block reaching the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve or obturator nerve is tantalizing, but not consistently achieved. These nerves are best blocked separately if desired. Many people, however, find an in-plane approach is easier for needle visualization and it is a perfectly acceptable technique. It may not, however, reliably cover the hip joint in supratrochanteric proximal femur. Regardless of whether an out-of-plane or in-plane approach is used, the target for needle tip placement is the same. Aim to place the needle tip under fascia iliaca immediately lateral to the nerve. There is a potential space here, which can be entered with minimal risk of transfixing the nerve. Injection here will fill the fascial compartment and outline the nerve. Here is an example of an out-of-plane approach to the femoral nerve. As I have said, aim to enter the fascia iliaca compartment of the femoral nerve as it, at its lateral corner and not directly on top of the nerve. Hydrolocation with a half mil of fluid will show if the needle tip is in the right compartment. If a linear spread is seen, it indicates that fascia iliaca has not yet been pierced. Advance one pop and one layer deeper and perform another test injection. Always appreciate the tactile pops in the visual rebound as fascial layers are pierced. Spread in the right compartment is expansile and outlines the borders of the femoral nerve. This is an in-plane example of a femoral nerve block. The nerve boundaries are as shown under fascia iliaca. The needle is inserted from lateral to medial to pierce fascia iliaca at the lateral corner of the nerve. A test injection shows a linear spread pattern and the needle is thus advanced slightly deeper. Now the spread is more expansile, signifying it is within the correct fascial compartment. Once this is seen, inject the full volume while scanning slightly cranial and caudal to confirm the spread around the nerve. I do not usually reposition the needle and instead rely on the fact that effective spread around the nerve will be directed by the paraneural sheath. I'll end with a comment on neurostimulation. I personally do not routinely use it with ultrasound guidance myself, but it is a helpful adjunct primarily to avoid intraneural needle placement. With the current set at 0.2 milliamps, there should be no motor responses seen when the needle tip is within the fascia iliaca compartment next to the nerve. If the nerve can be visualized as is usually the case, it is not necessary for efficacy and it may only serve to prolong block performance or lead to unnecessary needle passes. The key to a successful block, as always, is visualizing spread around the nerve in its sheath. If seeking a motor response, note that either a sartorius or patella twitch is acceptable when this is combined with ultrasound visualization. Ultrasound visualization is essential to ensure the endpoint of good spread. Contact with the lateral portion of the nerve as recommended and not the medial portion will elicit a patella twitch as this is the location of the posterior division that innervates the quadriceps muscle rather than sartorius. Thanks for watching as always, and don't forget to check out the other related videos on ultrasound guided regional anesthesia techniques on this channel.